actually not fentanyl that's at the center of the debate here. It's the other drugs. They think that we are lazy and don't want to work. Oh my God, it's sold out. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court released its report on sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, identifying more than 300 priests and 1,000 child victims across six of the state's dioceses. The report details 70 years of sexual misconduct and a systematic cover-up by church leaders and calls for reforms including abolishing the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse. Predators in every diocese weaponized the Catholic faith and used it as a tool of their abuse. The time of telling these victims to keep their truth to themselves has ended. At least 35 people were killed after a highway overpass collapsed during heavy rain in the Italian city of Genoa. A 260-foot section of the bridge fell some 150 feet onto train tracks and into a river below. Police in London arrested a 29-year-old man on suspicion of terrorism after he appeared to deliberately drive into the Houses of Parliament this morning while lawmakers were on recess. The car hit three people before crashing into one of the concrete barriers installed after three car attacks in London killed pedestrians last year. After the government spent 10 days calling on 35 people to testify against former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort, the defense rested on the 11th day after calling zero witnesses, not even their own client. Manafort's lawyers say the prosecution hasn't established proof of tax or bank fraud. This morning, Nebraska became the first state to execute a prisoner using a cocktail of drugs, including fentanyl, the opioid that caused 30,000 overdoses in the U.S. last year. The inmate, a 60-year-old man named Kerry Dean Moore, was convicted of a double murder back in 1979. He spent nearly four decades on death row. 31 states use capital punishment, but there's a nationwide shortage of the drugs that states usually use to kill people because a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't want the drugs they make to be used for capital punishment. So prison systems are scrambling to come up with alternatives, which is why Nebraska turned to fentanyl as part of a cocktail that's never before been used together. Diazepam, a sedative, then fentanyl to slow Moore's breathing, followed by cisatracurium, a paralyzing agent, and finally, potassium chloride to stop the heart. Bioethicists say that states using untested drug combinations is a bad idea. The concern of a lot of these drugs being used in execution is that they weren't meant to be used in that manner, they haven't been tested to be used in that manner, and they aren't approved to be used in that manner. And I think it kind of green lights this idea that it's okay to experiment on people who are criminals and have been convicted because they're going to die. And if it's a rough death, that's okay. When ethically, that's not okay. With the opioid crisis gripping the U.S., it's the fentanyl that's getting the attention. But it's actually not fentanyl that's at the center of the debate here. It's the other drugs. Kerry Dean Moore was ready to die, and he didn't want to delay the execution. But a German drug company did. Fresenius Kabi makes the satracurium and the potassium chloride, but doesn't allow them to be sold to prisons. So the company sued Nebraska to find out where the state purchased the drugs. Nebraska would only say that it got the drugs legally. The suit mirrors a similar case in Nevada in July, where the state planned to execute Scott Dozier using a cocktail including the sedative midazolam. The company that makes midazolam sued successfully on grounds that the state had gotten the drug illegally. I first interviewed Dozier days before he was scheduled to die. We spoke again by phone this morning. It's an interesting thing to be a little bit envious. Like, I'm not usually too concerned about someone getting someplace first before me, but I have a little bit of twinge. Like, motherfucker, man, you got an accomplishment I was not able to. You son of a bitch. It's a strange, a strange thing. The tactic didn't work in Nebraska. A judge ruled that the people of Nebraska had spoken by voting in 2016 to restore the death penalty in the state and that delaying the execution would be, quote, tantamount to nullifying Nebraska law. 
The state went ahead with Moore's execution today, and he was pronounced dead at 10.47 a.m. Eleven states are now aiming to force some people who apply for Medicaid to prove they're working 80 hours a month, or trying to, before they can get benefits. The Trump administration has given permission to four states to implement that work requirement, including Arkansas. A lawsuit filed there today says the program violates the Constitution, echoing a successful suit in Kentucky. But the administration says it's standing firm. Seven other states, including Ohio, want permission to put similar work requirements in place. No, oh, Mama. You want something to drink? Aisha Parker is a 32-year-old mother of two in Cleveland. She makes just above the minimum wage, working part-time as a home health care aide. She gets about 80 hours of work each month, which just meets the minimum required hours for the state's new plan. It's hot, it's hot. Her hours depend on whether her clients need her. And if she gets sick, she can't go into work at all. Parker gave birth this spring and uses Medicaid to cover postpartum care. If you could talk to the lawmakers who brought this about in Ohio, what would you tell them? They feel like a lot of us who are trying to get assistance from them, from the, the government, they think that we are lazy and don't want to work. In my case, I'm working, but I can't afford a insurance. I don't think people understand how real it is. If you live in any of the 26 Ohio counties where unemployment has been consistently high, greater than 120% of the national unemployment rate for the last two years, you're exempt from the work requirements. As it turns out, those exempt counties are mostly rural, and they're 92% white. Cuyahoga County has a slightly lower unemployment rate, so it doesn't qualify for the exemption. But the biggest city in Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, certainly would. Cleveland is where Parker lives. It also happens to be 51% black. So, is this policy racist? A well-known Medicaid expert coined the phrase, this is Medicaid redlining, that we're redlining communities, Medicaid beneficiaries, by not providing the same you know, options, just taking into account the same conditions in cities as we might in counties. John Corlett ran Ohio's Department of Medicaid under a previous governor. It doesn't take into account that many people uh, they have just very irregular work schedules. They work part-time jobs. They're the folks that take the tickets from us in the parking garage. They're the folks who check us out at the grocery store or the fast food restaurant. Their hours fluctuate all the time. And the burden becomes on these individuals to report all that. And they could just sort of get lost you know, in the shuffle. The Ohio Department of Medicaid chose to use county data because it's readily available. It's also how the federal government keeps track of unemployment. The department declined to speak with Bice on camera, but in a letter to Democrats this summer, it defended the policy, saying it is inappropriate and hasty to conclude the overall policy is unfair. Republicans in the state legislature, who called for the work requirements in the first place, agree. Unemployment in an inner city, in a place like Cleveland, is about the same as a really rural Appalachian County. So why shouldn't the people in Cleveland get the exact same exemption that those folks in Appalachia get? Well, poverty can be poverty. Without a doubt. There are certain things, I think, that metropolitan areas have that more rural areas don't. Now, that's not to say that people who are unemployed in rural areas should not have the ambition to find help. But the access to programs is much greater in a metropolitan area than it is in a much more rural area. Fortney also says the policy isn't racist. It's the people making race an issue who are themselves racist. I don't know any program that's ever drawn around race. And, and quite frankly, if somebody, is flo if somebody is really floating that idea, um, it's misleading political rhetoric at the very least, and it's really offensive racist rhetoric that's uncalled for at the worst. What's been presented to me is that this is an issue that didn't take into account the people, minority folks in the inner city. Is it possible that that happened? That's something that you would have to ask the Department of Medicaid about. Uh, I think, uh, again, the goal is to get people connected with a job, regardless of what your skin color is. Parker's status as a single mom means if she can't work 80 hours each month, 
she can ask for an exemption because she's the primary caregiver for her daughters. And Fortney notes that there's a committee in place to evaluate cases like Parker's to ensure the policy isn't cruel. But Corlett says the state's plan has already done damage. We are one of the poorest cities in the country. And so a policy that doesn't reflect that, that doesn't take that into account in terms of what the Medicaid program is trying to do, I think is tragic. Migrant crises around the world tend to have at least one thing in common, the rejection on nationalistic grounds of people with darker skin or a different religion. Mayotte is different. It's an island off East Africa, but it's also a region of France. The Mahare have the full rights and social services that come with French citizenship. De trouver des personnes qui essaient d'entrer sur le territoire français. On est revenu chaque matin avec le trois, entre trois et huit personnes. Those benefits have made Mayotte a target destination for migrants from the neighboring, less developed Comoros Islands, which share history, culture, and religion with the Mahore. Earlier this year, thousands of Mahore went on a two-month labor strike to demand immigration enforcement. Raison pour laquelle on a demandé la grève. On a demandé, on ne demande pas grand chose. Hein? La paix, la sécurité. Mela Mouhadji was one of the strike leaders. French officials are meeting with her to try to prevent more protests. She also heads an anti immigrant group called Kodim, which blames Comorian migrants for an increase in crime and violence on the island. Members use décazage, an illegal vigilante tactic. They tear down migrants' makeshift homes, destroy their belongings, and try to force them out. After the labor strike, France pledged millions of dollars in development for the island. It also sent more police, who've been carrying out raids, looking for people living in Mayotte illegally. Nineteen-year-old Aria Hassani wants to go to university in France. But she can't leave the island or work without a visa. Si il il mettait les visas à jour et les donnait aux gens, c'est sûr que les, de nombreuses personnes partiraient. Parce que à quoi bon rester à Mayotte si on vous aime pas? Alors que si tu pars ailleurs, tu auras une vie pas trop meilleure, mais au moins on te détestera pas comme ici. Mela and other Kodim members are planning their next steps. Donc les Maoris ne sont pas xénophobes. Les Maoris réclament ce qu'ils en ont. On ne peut pas non plus euh, mettre tous euh, les misères du monde dans, dans Mayotte aussi. Donc les décasages, on le fait et là on est fiers de le faire. Pourquoi Parce que les autorités ne font pas leur travail. But as angry as Kodim's members are with the migrants, they're more frustrated with France. Ils ont donné des séjours à ces gens-là. Ces gens-là n'ont même pas le droit de travailler, n'ont même pas le droit de voyager. On veut nos terrains, on va nous mettre en, en, en prison, on s'en fout, on va enlever toutes les personnes qui occupent les maisons illégalement, on va les faire partir. Quand on me dit que la loi a dit que, mais on est à métropole, on est français, oui, on est français, mais on est français comment
Today, a Union of Concerned Scientists study revealed that scientists who work for the federal government are concerned. To be more specific, they're displeased with their relationship with the Trump White House and its political appointees because they don't feel supported in their work. And some agencies are feeling it more than others. At the EPA, there's a lot of fear. We see that job satisfaction has really decreased and that they're having a lot of issues in doing the scientific work and fulfilling their agency's science-based mission. There were positive results, though, too, notably from the FDA, where scientists seem a lot more cheerful. The FDA was definitely stood out in this year's survey as particularly interesting because we saw, you know, some really positive results there, and we didn't expect that. Respondents were really positive about the current commissioner who's heading up the agency. And I don't think it's any coincidence then that at that agency, at the FDA, we see higher job satisfaction. So if there is anything worth taking away from these results, it's that government scientists really benefit from having a good leader. And now, one might actually be on the way. President Trump recently revealed his pick for the head of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, basically his chief personal science nerd. His name is Kelvin Drogemeyer, and he's a meteorologist with a PhD in atmospheric science. He's a registered Republican, and he's worked for the government before, sitting on the National Science Board under both President Bush and Obama. He hasn't spoken publicly about climate change, though, which is notable given how awkward of a subject it is in the Trump White House. Oh, and apparently, Drogemeyer drives a Harley Davidson motorcycle. But more importantly, he's very well liked by his colleagues and members of the scientific community. He provided good leadership to the National Science Board. He's a person of integrity. He's an excellent scientist. He has a perfect blend of background experience, knowledge, and personal characteristics to take this job on and do it well. He's extremely well thought of in the scientific community. You know, he's a good communicator. He's a very friendly, approachable person. He's not afraid to dig in and do the work and really do the research and bring the data to why that we're making the decisions we're making. I actually think that the president probably couldn't have found a better person to name to this office than Kelvin. He will bring the science communities back into the White House. No modern president has taken as long as President Trump to fill the science advisor position. That's a big deal because the science advisor has the power to herd various federal agencies to work together toward a specific target. During President Obama's tenure, for instance, the targets varied from nuclear disasters and hurricanes to Zika and Ebola, crises that we still face today. So now at least, if Drogemeyer is confirmed, federal scientists will have a shot at gaining the leader and White House ally they've been craving. Kelvin Drogemeyer politely and promptly declined a request for an interview. He also declined to tell me his views on climate change. But he did confirm that he does, in fact, drive a Harley. This is Beijing-born fashion guru Tao Lian, but nobody actually calls him that. By the way, what should I call you? Bags, Mr. Bags? Actually, Boston in Sun? Chinese, people call me Bao Bao. You want me to call you Bao Bao? Yeah, you can't call me Bao Bao. Bao Bao, or Mr. Bags, went to college in the U.S. to study finance. But he ditched that path to run a blog about how to buy luxury handbags. Four years and four million followers later, he's got his own team of employees, and he's quite possibly the most authoritative voice in luxury handbags in China. And odds are, he's younger than you. He just turned 26. When did you get started with bags? My parents, like, they do finance. So they're within the finan financial industry. So they really expect me to work in the same field. And I just love fashion, and I just shop a lot. Like in Los Angeles, I went to Rodeo Drive like maybe four or five days out of a week. Really? Yes. What do you think it is about you that all your followers like? There's a lot of people out there writing about bags, a lot of people writing about fashion. What is it about Tao Song that does it for them? 
we are all consumers. Like all of our team, we have this perspective of a luxury consumer. Mm. So we know what they want. We know what they need. I can tell like if this bag is going to be popular in China. This is sort of like my special power now. Within a few years, it wasn't just consumers who wanted his advice on bags. Brands started calling him up too. Last year, Givenchy and Longchamp released limited edition bags with Mr. Bag's branding, and they sold out immediately. And now he's about to do his biggest collaboration ever with another luxury brand, Todd's. I have to show this to you. Is this? That's cute. I gotta say, that's dog. a cute bag. These $1,500 bags are being sold exclusively on a social networking app called WeChat. And he's hoping to sell out all 300 of them within an hour. Inside is the Mr. Vax Heart Tots. There it is. One minute. Ooh, one minute. We have to start now. All right, let's go. Oh, for the first minute, we got five, 56 people already paid the money and bought really? the bag. Yes. 70. 70 now. Oh, 100. 100. 100. It is 10.04. Four minutes. Four minutes. Yes. Four minutes you sold already. 100. Because each of them is 10,000 RMB. Uh -huh. So right now it's a million RMB. Oh my God, it sold out. Everything is sold Everything's out. Everything's sold out. It's 10, it's been seven minutes. In seven minutes, he made over 3 million RMB. That's about $500,000. I see you on a lot of lists as a key opinion leader, mm -hmm. KOL. Yes. What do you think about that term? I think in this new generation, it's not like you have to act or you have to sing to mm -hmm. become someone influential. If there's something you're good at and you want to share it with people, mm -hmm. then you can become influential. A lot of Mr. Bag's success is due to a couple recent developments in the Chinese market. First is China's growing middle class, which has a huge appetite for luxury. In fact, one-third of luxury goods sold across the globe go to Chinese consumers. Second, most of those Chinese consumers are completely addicted to WeChat, which lets you talk to your friends, post status updates, pay your rent, and now shop without even switching applications. Mr. Bags isn't only on the internet. He's also starting to do public appearances, where fans can get selfies with him, hang out with cute dogs, eat custom Mr. Bags cake, and maybe even buy an extra bag. Mr. Bag started out by giving consumers advice about the best bags in the Chinese luxury market. But now he's actually influencing that market. We work with a lot of different brands. Even when brands are working with us in a commercial way, mm -hmm. we would, if they want to push one style that we feel like not good for Chinese consumers, we would definitely stop that. Sometimes we tell them, stop pushing this bag in China. This is not going to be it. This is a more European style. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should try this mini style. Maybe it will work. Mm -hmm. Or like, why don't you have this pink color in China? Like Chinese people love it so much. You're kind of this first wave. Mm -hmm. And so there's no blueprint for mm -hmm. what's too far for a fashion blogger. What, what, is, what could make it look like you're selling out? Do you ever think about that? I have a long-term dream, is that one day I want to build up a Chinese luxury brand. Before, when people think of made in China, they think of something that's poor quality, or not necessarily poor quality, but not something super good quality. I really want to reverse that image. I want to tell them like, made in China tags can be something really, really good. <laughs>